Well, once again, good morning. Welcome. So glad to have all of you here with us, both physically and online. My name is Pastor Steve. I'm the pastor here at Love of Christ, and we love uh, that you are here today. We're continuing our, our sermon series on, on a miraculous summer. We're just kind of going through uh, the miracles of Jesus, and in each one, it's amazing how it, it, it tells a little bit different story, it gives a little bit more insight into who Jesus is. Now, many of the miracles we've been looking at have, have been from the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, they, they oftentimes have similar stories or accounts of Jesus and his miracles. Today we're looking at John, and John is a, uh, is a different kind of animal from the other disciples, or at least the other Gospels, because uh, John, John writes from maybe a, a deeper perspective. We think John might have been 80 years old, maybe 90 years old when he was writing this. Uh, he was an older man looking back, seeing what Matthew, Mark, and Luke had written. He kind of decides to go a different path, tell, tell a little bit different story, include different things. And I think for, for John, this story, uh, Jesus turning water into wine, the other gospel writers don't include it, but he thinks it's, hey, here we go. This is a really important story. Now, I've already, I, I don't know, but I like weddings. I don't know if you guys like weddings. There's always a big party and celebration. That's a lot of fun. As a pastor, uh, it gets a little bit odd for me because sometimes I go to weddings and I know hardly anybody. <laughs> I go to a wedding, like, uh, for instance, you know, I, I usually work with a couple as, as we're counseling before the wedding, 10, 12 hours, maybe 15 hours, I, I'm with the couple. So I know the couple. Uh, but I don't necessarily know their friends. I don't necessarily know their family. And they were like, oh, pastor, you should come. Bring your wife and your family. And I'm like, okay. And then we sit there and we're like, we don't know any. I'm like, I know the two people that are busy talking to everybody else. And that's about it. So sometimes weddings for me can be you know, a little bit peculiar. Because at least for the other people who've been invited to the wedding, they know at least some other people. And if you're part of the family, maybe you know about half the people that are there. If you're with the, with the bride, for instance, you might know the bride's side of the family better. Uh, and, and here I am, kind of odd man out. And as I, as I think about this wedding, I, I, I wonder who the odd man out was. Who, who's, who's kind of on the outside looking in? As we look at this, and, and if you were paying attention to the, to the reading, what's amazing is that Jesus and his disciples were invited to this wedding. Now, ancient weddings are a little bit different. Uh, they would last for five days, seven days, some of these wedding celebrations, and they were for the whole community, uh, though the whole town was, was usually just assumed to be invited. They would just show up it was because it was a celebration for the community. One person from their community, at least, sometimes two, were, were taken off the table for uh, eligible bachelors or bachelorettes. Right? So everyone needed to know who was, who was getting married, what was going on. And this process leading up to the wedding was a long one. Uh, oftentimes a betrothal would last for up to a year before. So what we kind of do, engagement kind of a thing, this was also uh, a, a tradition. And during this time leading up, the, the betrothal, the, the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom were probably negotiating how this whole thing was going to work out. Uh, oftentimes these marriages were arranged, um, and, and so there were, there were certain things that had to be taken care of, certain details. So once the betrothal happens, everyone kind of looks ahead to the wedding feast and celebration. I don't know if they had the save the date cards, you know, that we send out uh, for, for weddings, but there was definitely an anticipation and, and there's a buildup before the wedding, just like uh, in today, just like today. And so this, this wedding, this celebration, people knew it was going to be happening, and Jesus and his disciples are invited. Now, if you go back one chapter in John, uh, we find out that there's, at this point, John has only recorded five disciples have been called. So I know normally we say Jesus and his disciples, we assume 12. John's kind of particular, I mean, there might have been only five disciples with him, uh, at least we know of five. Uh, Peter and, si uh, Peter and Andrew, the two, the two brothers, and then Philip and Nathaniel were also called at the end of John chapter 1, and one other disciple, <laughs> unnamed disciple. And when you're reading in John and there's an unnamed disciple, 
generally we can assume it's, it's perhaps John. I, I'm going to go with that assumption. I know it's kind of a, a big leap, but John writes the story as if he was there. If it was, he was an eyewitness account. And whether or not he was that one disciple that is unnamed, or he is added in and doesn't really tell his story of how he's called, uh, we know at least five of the disciples are there, and they've been invited, which, which seems to indicate that they were family, that, or they, they knew of this person. They were from one town over, they come on over, there's a big celebration. And Mary is there, and Mary seems to have a, an important part to play. She's very concerned about there being enough food and beverage for everybody. Now, that seems odd for someone who's just a guest, who's there going, oh no, the wine's gonna run out. Sure, I mean, there's a concern about that, making sure you get your, you know, at a wedding that, that you go and, and if there's an open bar, you get your drink quick before, you know, they close it down and you have to pay cash, right? I mean, we, we've all been to weddings there, so quick, grab two drinks maybe, bring them back to the table. But I don't think that's what Mary is, is talking about here. She seems to be intimately involved. I, was it a family member? Maybe a family member of Jesus, a distant family member? Mary's very concerned. Because in the ancient world, throwing a big feast and celebration like that, if you ran out of food or drink, it was a social faux pas. I mean, a major error. It could give your family a black eye for years to come because you weren't good hosts. Now we think about it, we're like, whatever, you know, the keg ran dry, no big deal. For them, it was a major, major responsibility to make sure that they had enough food and beverage for everyone who came. And this idea of hospitality was so ingrained. Mary has a very special concern that maybe there's going to be a problem. And she goes to Jesus with this issue. Now, I think it's, it's interesting. Jesus says, uh, woman, you know, why, why are you bothering me? And a lot of people say, oh, Jesus was, was, was throwing his mother off and saying, hey, get out of here. No, the, the term that he uses actually is one of great respect. Uh, it, it doesn't translate well into, um, in, into English, perhaps. I mean, it really does say it, it, it translates as woman. But the, the idea or the thought there is, is actually a reverential term, like ma'am. Uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was well thought of. So, so don't think that Jesus is trying to belittle his, his mom. Uh, he's always very respectful for his mom. And he says, why is this a concern of mine? Basically. He says, what is this between you and me? Like, it, it's, it's a worry of yours, but why, why bring me? Why involve me? Why should I be concerned about this? And he says, my hour has not yet come. That the timing is, is wrong. But notice that Mary doesn't give up. She, she, she brings the concern to Jesus, and then she goes and tells the servants, listen to what he says. You see, Mary knows that Jesus can do some amazing things. I, I don't know if she had seen Jesus as a little child do some amazing things, uh, his, his power, his ability to do things. We, we, John doesn't come onto the scene, the disciples don't come onto the scene until, until Jesus is, is much older. And so maybe Mary has seen some private miracles or private wonders or private signs. We don't know, the, the, the scripture doesn't tell us, but it's very possible uh, that Jesus is kind of doing, has been doing these things in the past. And so Mary knows there's something special about this guy. And so she tells the, the servants, listen to him. And it's an important point because Mary believes in Jesus before anybody else. She knows that he can do these special things somehow and in some way. And we think about the Gospel of John. John, John tells us his whole purpose in writing the Gospel is so that if he tells all of these miraculous wonders and signs, people might believe. That believe is Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. This happens in, uh, at the end of the Gospel of John, John 20, uh, verses 30 and 31. He says, these things are written that you might believe. So John says, Jesus did a whole bunch of other things that I didn't write down, but these things are written that you might believe. And faith and belief is critical to those miracles of Jesus. 
Every time we have seen a miracle up to this point, there has been a faith element. Whether it's casting out a demon, whether it's healing someone, the people either have faith in Jesus to begin with, particularly uh, those who are, are, are Greek or outside the, the family of, uh, of Israel, the, the descendants of Jacob, there's a faith there. And Jesus says, your faith is great. Your faith has made you well. There's a faith element. There's a belief aspect. And Mary believes Jesus can do this before anything happens. What's interesting is the disciples are just following Jesus at this point. John makes a, a note that at the end of this account, the disciples then believed. It was, it was after this account that, that now the disciples believe. But up until this point, Mary's the only one who believes. And Jesus comes through in a clutch. Right? So these, these, these bottles of water, these are these jars of water, they're there, they're for ritual cleansing, they're basically for baptism, if you think about it. Uh, the, 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 the ritual cleansing that the Jewish people did was, was washing their hands, or maybe washing their feet, and if they dipped their feet in it, they did not drink it. I mean, come on, wow. We're reading in 2 Corinthians 5 there, if we're out of our minds, it's for Christ. I wonder about that youth dude, I don't know. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I know that you know. Sometimes we want to dip our toe in the water to test it out, but that that's a whole different, whole different story there with that guy. But these baptismal water containers, these stone jars, are are, are there not for not for, not to drink out of, right? The, these are these are your hand washing basins. Is basically what they're there for. And Jesus comes and he takes them and he switches it up. So that these, these ritual cleansing or washing jars, containers, are the very vessels that Jesus uses to pull and transform into wine. And I think it's significant in a couple of, a couple of different, uh, for a couple of different reasons. Now Moses, you go back to the Old Testament, he was able to pull water out of rocks. That was pretty amazing. Oh, and God, and they're out in the, the, the children of Israel, they're, they're wandering in the desert, they're thirsty, and Moses goes to rock, and he, boop, there comes out water. Jesus is able to pull wine out of stone. Think about that. He's, he's better than Moses. I don't know if John makes that connection, but Jesus is better than Moses because he can pull wine out of jars, and, and wine is better than water. Wine is always accompanied by joy, celebration. We can, we can read in, in Scripture multiple different places. Deuteronomy 7, verse 13, there's talking about, about wine that comes. And this is, a, this is a blessing of God when they come to an, a, a new land, or Jeremiah 31, or Isaiah 25, or Joel 3. There's all these different places where wine is, is considered part of a, a blessing of God or a celebration. And so when Jesus turns water into wine, this is a grace of God. This is a joy of God. In fact, in Psalm 104, verse 15, excuse me, 104, verse 15, God says that he's going to give wine to gladden the heart of man. So wine and joy, wine and celebration, wine and grace we have to understand these things are, are very, very closely tied together. And especially when you, when you see the connection through the water of the washing and cleansing, sort of like what we just did a little while ago in confessing our sins, to be washed clean was a grace of God. But Jesus takes it even one step further and says it's a joy, it's a celebration. And so this, this wedding celebration is here where John records the first miracle of Jesus, and I think John recognizes, maybe for the first time, that Jesus is who he says he is. And so for John, this miracle, this, this wedding at Cana is transformative. Because after this, after this miracle, after this sign, the disciples now believe. And John goes, oh my goodness. 
So for John, in his journey with Jesus, it might very, very well have started here at this wedding and with this realization. And so for John, this is the first miracle. This is the first sign that Jesus gives because it was the first sign that he saw. The first sign that he was like, whoa, wait a minute. Now I believe this Jesus is who he says he is. And so what is this, what is this story for us? What, is, what does it do for us? You know, we, we always ask that question as we're looking at these miracles. Oh man, what do these miracles mean? Can we really change water into wine like Caleb tried? Um, is, that, is that the point of the story? That Jesus continues the party going? That he, he rescued people from a, from a social uh, embarrassment, an embarrassing situation? I, I think there's, there's, there's three things that we can kind of draw, that we can draw from this. And that first one, we talked about that faith and belief. That Mary believes first and foremost, even before the miracle happens. And that John and, his, and the disciples, they believe after this, the first sign. But what's interesting to note is that this is not done in a public way. So when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, he might be talking about, it is not my time yet to do public miracles. Because if you notice, the only people who actually know how the water got into wine, Mary suspects, and doesn't say that she knows, she believes regardless, the servants who drew out the water and brought it to the, uh, to the master of the banquet, they knew, doesn't necessarily say that they believed, and the disciples watched the whole thing and they believed. But did anybody else, did anybody else at the wedding even know what happened? For them, the wine just kept on flowing. It was fine. And so this, this secret, this, this secret of who Jesus is, is still kind of hidden. And Jesus wants to reveal it first to those who are close around him. The disciples are first to know who Jesus is. Do they fully understand? No. Do they they fully believe? Yeah, they believe he's special. They know something about him. It isn't until later that they continue to walk with him, that there are more miracles, there's more things, and even then they still don't totally get it. But they're the insiders. They're the first ones to know. And maybe that's where the odd man out is. That, that Jesus and his disciples are on the inside, Mary's on the inside, but pretty much everybody else is in the dark as to who Jesus is. And as we think about uh, our lives, we're, we're kind of those insiders, we're those disciples, we're the followers of Jesus, and to be honest, there's a lot of people still walking around in fog. They, they, they can't see the sun. They might know he's there, but they don't really know who he is. And as as the disciples walk with Jesus, eventually they become the ones who are called to be his witnesses. And so if you are on the inside track, if you know who Jesus is, and as you look at this miracle and you go, oh my goodness, Jesus can, can change the molecular structure of water into wine and make it the best wine uh, that, that the, the steward, head steward, or the master of the banquet had ever tasted. He's like, oh my goodness, this is the best wine. What are you doing bringing it out last? You should bring it out first. And Jesus is able to do that. And that kind of brings us to the, to the second point. Notice the day that this happens. John says it right away at the beginning. It's something you just can easily flow right past. It's on the third day. John says it's the third day doesn't say it's the third day of the week, the third day after, third day of the festival ceremony, the celebration, third day, who knows, third day. It's assumed it's the third day of the week. It's a Tuesday. Uh, that's, that's how they would reckon it in the ancient world. But the third day, why does John include that? Third day is a day of transformation. Think about Jonah in the belly of the big fish. On the third day, He's ejected. Right? On the third day, Jesus rises from the dead. See, this third day was a day of transition and transformation. And on the third day, Jesus takes water, turns it into wine. On the third day, or on the day of transformation, God can take you and me and change us on a molecular DNA kind of level, change our hearts. 
and, and turn them into holy, holy hearts. Corrupted, awful, sick, black hearts can be transformed, changed, modified for you and me. And the timing has to be right. right? The timing has to be right. Is it Jesus' time to transform your heart? I hope every day when you come to, in the morning you wake up and you go, God, be with me today. Transform my heart today. Every day is going to be the third day. Every day is going to be a Tuesday. You're like, oh, okay, I have my heart changed. I have my heart transformed. God can do it. Jesus waits for the exact timing. God waits for the exact timing to send his son into this world. He, sent, he waits for the exact timing for his son to reveal himself, the exact timing for his son to die on the cross, the exact timing for him to be raised from the dead. And his timing is right for you and me. If you notice, Mary can't command Jesus to do it. She doesn't say, Jesus, turn this into water into wine, and he obeys her. She, she doesn't even think she has that, that right, but she hints at it. We also can't command God to say, God, you have to forgive me. If you notice, when, whenever we confess our sins, we're, we, we're begging God, show us your mercy once again. We, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. God gives it to us in his time, in his way, through his son, Jesus Christ, and we're transformed. We are transformed. And so I pray that, that as you come before God, maybe it's the right time now for you that your heart, you've been resisting Jesus, you've been trying to hold back, and, and now the Holy Spirit's moving in your heart. And maybe today is the day that we were singing before. Today is the day. Maybe today is the day that your heart is transformed. And even if you are an insider, you already know who Jesus is, today is the day for your heart to be transformed again. I love that passage in, in 2 Corinthians 5 where it says, we are a new creation. On a, on a molecular level, we are something different now because Jesus has come into our hearts. There we are, transformed, changed. Now we are God's children. And then finally, I think we want to we notice that Jesus changes water into wine. And again, notice where that joy comes from. That to bookend the life of Jesus here, he takes wine and a very special meal, the Passover meal, and he connects that wine to his blood. That joy, the joy of our salvation here found in him. So as he pours out his blood, he is pouring out wine, grace, love, and mercy for you and me. John is probably the only gospel writer who really makes that connection of Jesus' body being bread, his wine being the blood, and seeing that through the stories that he tells, that Jesus is this gift, a feast, a wedding feast for you and me. And whenever we get to celebrate communion, we have that, that body and, and blood, we have that bread and wine together, be reminded that this is the joy of God's grace given to you and to me, that here in this story of John chapter 2, we have an amazing gift of cleansing, of redeeming, of transformation, of being able to go out with the joy that God goes with us wherever we go. You see, that's what, that's what John is about. He's about the glory of God revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. That's what John wants to show. Jesus glorified. And so as we go from here today, there's some things that we need to take with us with this, this passage, with this, with this account. I want you to remember and think about this. Anytime you go to a wedding, think, think about this. Anytime you have a glass of wine, think about this. First, just like John's whole point of his gospel in John 20, 30 to 31, what you need to do, what, we, what we're called to do is because of this, because of the stories and the accounts that the gospel writers give to us about Jesus. We're supposed to believe. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing in him, we might have life in his name. That's, that's the simple thing. Just believe. I know it sounds like you're like, whoa, yeah, that was brilliant, Pastor. Amazing, you know. But it, it's a simple thing to jump past and jump over and assume. Where, where is your hang-up in believing on Jesus? What, what is it that, that maybe Jesus doesn't care about you? He's not involved in your life. When we look at John chapter 2, 
Jesus is involved in a relatively trivial matter. Think about it. Yeah, so what? Someone has a, a social black eye for, for, for a year or two or a decade, right? I mean, it really isn't all that critical that the wine keeps flowing for the wedding, and yet Jesus involves himself in a non-critical event, yes, to show his glory, yes, so that his disciples would believe in him, but it's not showy, it's not big, he, he's not trying to get the whole crowd to follow him. That's, that's not the point here. And sometimes we, we, we're afraid to invite Jesus into our lives because, ah, my life's not that big. That's not, not that important. Why would God care about me? But he does. And, and so believing in Jesus is more than just, oh yeah, there was this guy who is and happens to be the son of God, and yeah, he died for me. Ho-hum. He wants to be involved in your life. Jesus wants to be involved in whatever trivial matter you might have. And you're like, I don't want to bother the Son of God with the fact that I've got a hangnail, you know. Do it. Get him involved in everything that's going on in your life. And guess what? You're going to see amazing things happen. Now, maybe the hangnail is not going to heal itself right away. But there's going to be other things that when we bring Jesus into our life in every single situation... We see him acting and moving in ways that we wouldn't otherwise see. He wants to be involved even in what we consider trivial matters. He wants to be involved. So we need to believe that he is not only the Messiah, the Son of God, but that he is a partner in our lives with us. That he wants to be there and walk with us in every situation. And so, we're, so not only are we supposed to believe in Jesus, but we should pray in all circumstances. That's what Paul says, pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Basically, it's just this invitation that Jesus, we're gonna want him in our lives to continue to pray, to believe and to pray. I mean, we believe in, in prayer so much here. We, we encourage people to submit prayer requests. We encourage you guys to submit prayer requests at any time. Two o'clock in the morning, you wake up, you can't sleep. And you're like, oh my goodness. I've got this big, I've got, I've got two kids in college, so <laughs> i got this big biology exam tomorrow. Okay, you know what? Let's pray about it. Let's, let's, let's cast all our anxieties on Jesus. And at any point in time, you can go to loveofchrist.org slash prayer or prayers, and, and you can fill out a form there, and we're, we'll get it, and we're going to pray for you. Again, we might not pray right at 3 o'clock in the morning. I might not be up to see it. But when I get up in the morning, I'll see it, and I'll pray for you. We can give those prayers. We can give those things. We can give the community an opportunity to pray together. And we're going to do that in just a little bit. And so if you have a prayer request in mind or something that's burdening your heart, it doesn't matter how trivial it might seem, we're going to take it to the Lord in prayer. Because we believe that God is, the, is, is caring for us. He's compassionate. He loves to show his mercy. Jesus himself wants to walk alongside of us. We believe that, so we pray. So I encourage you to do that. And then as we go from here today, the third thing we should do is proclaim God's glory to everyone we can, to everyone around us, everyone we can. That's, that's what we talk about, sharing the love of Christ. That's our, that's our motto here uh, at, at the church. Love of Christ is the name of the church. We want to share the love of Christ every day. How do we do that? We tell people about the amazing things that God has been doing for us. Right? We, we, we can tell people certainly about uh, the Gospels and the stories of the, uh, of the New Testament, sure. But what is God doing in your life? How, how is Jesus amazing to you? How can we praise God for these things? I praise God for all kinds of things. I, I praise God. I, I am not worthy to have the family that I do. Whether, whether being a child of, of, of my parents, a sibling of, of, you know, four brothers and three sisters, to be a parent of, of four amazing kids, to be a husband of an amazing wife, I, none of that do I deserve. I am blessed beyond blessed beyond blessed. And if you want to talk to me about those things, I'm going to proclaim God's glory because I've been gifted with so much. I'm like, God has been so good to me in so many ways. 
And I can tell you about how amazing it is to, to have now two kids in college and then two kids at home. How blessed I am to have 15 year olds who I can actually trust to drive down the interstate uh, while I'm sitting in the passenger seat, not really paying too much attention because I know they've got it. If you've ever worked with a 15 year old trying to drive, that's an amazing thing. I'm very blessed. And not only do I have one, I've got two that can do that. That's amazing. I'm blessed beyond blessed. Where is God in your life? What can you glorify God for? What are the good things that God brings into your, your day? Maybe it's just, praise God, I was able to come to church today, right? right? Amazing. In, in, in this whole crazy mixed up COVID-19 circumstance that I still get to come to church. I still get to praise God. Jesus is amazing. And as you continue to talk about and glorify God for all of the good things, not just in our prayers, thank you God for all your blessings, but to the people around us. If God is that amazing, let's tell them. Let's tell them how God has blessed us. That as insiders, that we might take it to those who are outside and say, here is Jesus. Here is the one you're looking for. Here is the Messiah, the Son of God. And you too can be transformed with his love, whether it's a Tuesday, a Thursday, Saturday, it doesn't matter. Jesus is always willing to transform us. May, may your hearts be transformed, modified on that molecular level such that you can go and not only believe in Jesus, invite him into your life, but glorify him in all that you say and do, that others might see the reflected light of God's Son through you, that they too might come to believe and be saved by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord God, we thank you for your amazing love. We can't even fully comprehend it. You were just there all the time for us. And we ask that you would continue to be with us now. We invite you into every aspect of our lives, that, that you would walk alongside us and give us the courage to proclaim that good news, to proclaim your blessings that we could bring you glory. Bless us today in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.